I'm Steven, and this is E-Rock, and we're from Just Got Played, and today we are gaming through time. So we're going through the top games from 1975 on our favorite game from each year, the top-rated game on Board Game Geek uh, for each year. Uh, so if you've missed any of our previous videos, look down below. There are links for all those previous years. But in this video, we are doing the year 2000 to the year 2004. We're going into a new millennia here. I think it's really lucky that we made it this far, seeing as how the world was supposed to end in the year 2000. So, just saying. <laughs> Y2K, man. Computer Y2K, man. <laughs> I lived through that. <laughs> yes. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, I'm going to start us off with 2000 because this is one of my favorite games of all time. This is the game that I credit with kind of getting me back into the hobby. I grew up playing board games. Uh, through high school and then in college, I really more started playing video games after college, I even worked in the video game industry. And then my brother gave me a copy of Carcassonne. And I was like, all right, this is fun. And it kind of started, uh, we started having a game night. And it used to be we would do a board game one, one night, and then the next week we would do D&D &D and it would alternate. But eventually it just merged into board gaming but carcassonne was the game that i was pulling out at the first few game nights like let's play this and i love this game i really enjoy tile laying and uh this game <laughs> this game is a lot more cutthroat than people give it credit for i think a lot That's of people think like true. this is just a simple game but man if you're especially if you have um like I have some of the expansions like where you get extra credit for the longest road or the extra credit for the largest city. So if you're trying to build a long road, somebody is going to jump in there and try to hook into your road and steal it from you. If you're trying to build a big city, no matter what version, you know, somebody's going to try to jump in there and grab some of those city points or just completely steal the city from you. And if you're playing the original version or the advanced variant of the current version that's in print, the game, just some giant farm right? Yeah. He's going to score so many points, it's going to win the game. Right? And so people are just fighting over farms, but fighting over farms is interesting too, because you have a limited number of meeples. And when you commit a meeple as a farmer, they're out for the rest of the game. You know, if you put them down on a road as a thief or in a city as a knight, you, you could get them back, potentially. Yeah, right? once it's you complete the road feature. or complete the city. Yeah. Right. Same, same thing, even with the monks, they're, you know, they're a little hard to close off, but you, know, you get them back, uh, but the farmers are gone forever. So really, I mean, it's just such a simple thing, you know, like play a tile on your turn, right? Like, yeah, and right. I, I know some people that like get a hand of tiles and choose from it. And I understand where they're going with that. They like to have more choice and strategy. But for me, it's about doing the best I can with what I was given. I like I those agree. kind of games. You draw um, one tile, you play one tile. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we draw the tile at the end of our turn, so we have time to think about it. You know, it speeds the game up instead of drawing it at the start or whatever. But, you know, I just, you know, I love this game. And uh, I, I've tried some of the variations on it, like Carcassonne New World or whatever. And I still just go back to that. I like the original um, with some of the extra stuff. I mean, I've gotten some of the extra stuff just to have extra tiles, even if we don't play with the rules. We have so many tiles. Love it. All right. What have you got for 2000? Well, ironically, I'm not that big of a tile laying guy, but my choice is Carcassonne for this year. Yes. Three-way crossover again. Crossover. Just like at this the last video, video we had a three-way crossover right at the <laughs> beginning with El Grande. Now we have a three-way crossover with Carcassonne right out, of the, right out of the gate. I agree. This game is really, really nice uh, tile laying game. Most of this game is super simple. Most of it. The, the only thing that's even complicated really is trying to explain how the farms work and how you score those and whatnot. Other than that, the towns are super simple. The monastery is super simple. The roads, super simple. And, you know, and on top of everything, it makes a really pretty map. I, I really like it. looks like your, you know, bird's eye view over like medieval countryside with the towns and stuff. It's just a really cool game. It's really pretty. It's kind of chill. Uh, cause really, like you say, you draw, you draw one tile, you play one tile. And a lot of the times this game almost becomes like a co-op. Now, I don't mean with the placing of the meeples and trying to take over the cities and the roads or whatever, but every game I've ever played, you draw a tile and you're like, hmm, 
And everybody starts looking. They go, oh, well, we can go over here, or you can go over here, yeah. or there's a good spot over here. So it's all, it almost has this co-op, you know, like feeling to it as you're playing this game. It's just a really fun, yeah. good feeling type of game. Everybody's right? trying to put together the puzzle, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? Everybody's helping. They're like, yeah, we'll go right here. It's a good spot, you know? It's nice. Nice. Great. So 2000 Carcassonne across the board. Good across start. <laughs> All right. So funny, uh, I referenced the last video because in the last video, also, we talked a lot about uh, Reiner Kinesia, Dr. Reiner Kinesia. And I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to start 2001 off with another Kinesia game. Right. And this is Winner's Circle, uh, ah. which also is basically very similar to Royal Turf. In fact, the copy of it I have, you can play Royal Turf or Winner's Circle. It has cards for both. Um, and so this is another game that is just basically, you know, you roll a die and you move a horse, right? Very, very simple. Um, but before that, you do, you bet. You bet on which of the horses you think are going to finish. And each of the horses has uh, sort of a different ability, right? So the die that you roll in the game, it has three horse heads, uh, and then the other three sides of the die are like the saddle and the helmet and I don't know, the whip or something. Um, and every horse has a different number of spaces they are going to move, uh, depending on which uh, die roll you associate with that horse. So uh, some horses just do sort of okay at all of them. And other horses are bad at three of them, but really good at one of them. You know, so you... you kind of have to decide, well, which kind of horse am I going to bet on? And you, you place multiple bets, right? So you're not putting all your eggs in one basket. Uh, and we like to play with the variant where you can have a uh, bluff bet with the zero, right? Because your bets are face down. And so you have like a two bet, a one bet, and another one, and a zero, right? And so somebody thinks you're helping them with this horse, but no, you aren't. That's your zero, right? Um, and so, you know, then you roll on your turn and you're like, oh, I rolled a horse head. Uh, and now you have an interesting decision because you might be like, hmm, well, if I move this horse that I'm betting on with the horse head, it will move a decent amount. But if I roll the horseshoe, that was the other one. If I roll, you know, say I, I roll the horseshoe, this horse would go further. So I'm going to leave that horse and not move it, hoping somebody will move with the horseshoe. Instead, I'm going to take this other horse over here, which I don't have any bet on, that moves horribly slow with the horse. And I'm going to move that horse just to be mean to those people. Because um, all the horses have to move once before a horse can move again, right? Uh, so, you know, it's it's sort of that interesting decision. And then again, like you were talking about people uh, saying, hey, you can put the tile here, you can put the tile here with Carcassonne. People are like, oh, you to use the horseshoe on this horse. Come on. You know, like, or, <laughs> or no, 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 that one's going to overrun us. Stick, stick that one with the horse head. It's awful <laughs> for that horse, you know. And, um, and you, you know, you do that over the course of three races and you just, you know, add up the money that you get from the betting and uh, you see what you've got. And it's just so simple. Roll a die, move a horse. But the game is more complex than that. And just uh, it's always a lot of fun everybody just has fun playing this game it's not a brain burner you know or anything like that we just have fun you actually turned me on to this game and your top 100 uh i've never played it but now i'm watching a korean site or whatever trying to wait for the reprint to come out so i can get it so yeah I'm excited about that. Yeah, there are several different versions of this game. I personally like the Dice Tree version from Korea. I think I think it's the best. <laughs> yeah, it's nice painted horses and jockeys and stuff. It's beautiful. Yeah, they, the face-to-face -face version, the horses are hard to distinguish, and that does detract a little bit from the, <laughs> you know, when you're playing the game. Um, all right, so that's my 2001. What have you got for 2001? Okay. Now, this whole time, I've been telling you to warm up those typing fingers. And right now is when you're going to put them into practice because my game for 2001 is Funkenschlag. Ah, yes. That's right. Funkenschlag. For those of you who are unaware, this is the first version of Power Grid. And I have a feeling Power Grid is going to make another appearance on this list <laughs> at some point. But so, but I choose Funkenschlag. Uh, for those of you that have been watching us, you know that I am infuriating with these, and I'm sorry, but this is basically the same game. They've changed a couple of things. They basically took the crayons out and made a static board, and it's the same game. All right. So the, the basic point here is if you've never heard of Power Grid, you're competing, call them companies, 
trying to set up a power grid across whatever, the United States, Germany, they have maps for all kinds of places. And it's an incredibly economic game. There's an auction round in it where you buy power plants. And then after that, there's another phase in which, depending upon your turn order, you get to get the resources to power up your power plants, to power up your cities, to make the money. And like I said, depending upon your player order, that might be great or bad. Like there's only so much coal in the game and it gets more expensive. So if your power plants run off of coal and you're the only one using coal, you're probably in pretty good shape. But if you're choosing fourth and everybody's using coal, by the time it gets to you, that coal is going to be incredibly expensive. So there's all these kinds of different layers going on in this economy game with these different levels and layers of where the economy comes into play. The one detractor for this game, I cannot lie to you, is the last turn takes forever because everything is known in this game. There's no hidden information at all. So on the very last turn, everybody takes forever because you're trying to math everything out to the point that in the auction, which is the first part of the phase, the auction is stupid slow because you have to know how much can I bid on a power plant and still be able to power up my power plants and expand with the money that I have left in this round. But aside from that, fantastic game, still in our collection. I'd be happy to play. I have a uh, power grid deluxe and it's been sitting on my shelf <laughs> forever. It's uh, the, pr- the problem for me is that it, uh, I guess the game was out for so long that either people have already played it and therefore don't want to play it. Uh, when they're over to play a game with me or they haven't played it and are somewhat intimidated uh, by it. <laughs> listening, listening to people it, like you talk about it. <laughs> yeah, it is a little intimidating. It's not that hard. It's just math. Oh, also <laughs> it's, it's math hard. Also thematically it's boring, right? I mean, I mean, yeah, that's it's, true. It's, it's all okay. you're really doing is powering. Cities. Yeah. It's okay as a theme, but when you stack it next to the other games, I have theme wins out from all the other games. Right. So, you know, uh, I will, I will play it one day. Yeah, I hope so. Cause it's really good. So yeah, everybody so, should play. Yeah. So board game geek from 2001, there is an abstract, pure abstract strategy game as the number one game number one ranked game from 2001 and it is from the gipf project so have you heard of the gipf project it's not gipf i've I've never played any of these games but uh, i've seen a lot of videos and reviews actually uh, tom vassal is a big fan of a lot of these games so i've seen a lot of reviews on this whole series of games yeah never actually played them myself but you're right these are straight abstract like basically strip the theme off of Kinesia, and this is what you have right here. Yeah, and they all have some ridiculous name. Uh, the first one is called GIPF, <laughs> G-I-P-F, which is why it's called the GIPF Project. But the So specifically, the one from 2001 is Devon, D-V-O-N-N, all in capitals, right? Uh, and there are these red discs that are put out that are, I don't know, power centers or something. Maybe you could think of them because you have other discs and you're trying to make stacks of discs with yours on top. But if you somehow position some discs so that they're divorced from touching the red disc space, they die off or something. And you're just trying to have the biggest stack at the end of the game. Oh, no, I think you're supposed to have Maybe maybe you want to have the most total discs in all your stacks at the end of the game. I, I think that's well, somebody's going to be a Devon expert and tell us what's up in the comments. I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, this is one of those things where, like, if you like, you know, chess, Chinese checkers, any of those sort of um, classic abstract strategy games, and you want to see what a modern spin uh, on those uh, are, just look at any of the gift games. Uh, and yeah, so I specifically. Agree. Devon uh, is Devon. not not the highest rated one. I'm not sure what the highest rated one is. Maybe Devon. Tsar, yeah, maybe Tsar is the highest rated one. But uh, yeah, anyway, maybe Yinch. Uh, Yinch is up there, but I'm not sure it's the top. But you know, go go look at all of them. See which one yeah. floats your boat, right? And then try that one because I absolutely would if somebody put one of these yeah, in front of me and offered to teach. You're the kind of person that's like, you know, I really like playing games, but this theme really annoys me. This whole idea of theme then these will be right up your alley for sure. <laughs> I don't mind abstract strategy games, so I, I would play. I, I really love theme, oh, but I also Me either. I play Kinesia games. So. Oh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So are you ready to move on to 2002? Oh, I'm ready. Absolutely. All right. What have you got? 
For my game for 2002 is a slam dunk for me, and that is Puerto Rico. I absolutely love Puerto Rico. Uh, this is probably one of the games that really got me back into the hobby. Uh, this, I know, like Steve was talking about, Carcassonne was for him. I'm sure I played Carcassonne after Puerto Rico. Uh, there, I know if you've been watching these videos, I've talked a lot about games I played when I was a kid. And I played a ton of board games all the way up through high school. But then, you know, life happens and you're young. I didn't play a lot of board games for a while. And then really it was like three games. It was Catan, it was Power Grid, and it was Puerto Rico. And we got basically those three games around the same time. And that just ignited me back into board games. And probably my favorite of them is Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is so awesome. But the thing that I liked about it, especially back at that time, because if you, if you've been watching us, a lot of my games are kind of Ameritrash. It's a whole lot of random and throwing dice and stuff. And in Puerto Rico, almost nothing is random. Almost nothing. The only thing that's random is the, the specific fields that come out every turn. But other than that, everything's determined by the players. Uh, this is one of those games that, um, it's very common now, but back then it wasn't so much. Whereas like there's, it's a role selection and you would choose a, when you choose a role, everybody gets to do that. But the person that chose it gets a bonus. Now there's a whole lot of games like that. But back in the day, this was kind of revolutionary, you know? Well, but this game is different, not not just from that perspective, but also because in this game, more than I think probably any of the others I can think of, the timing of it is important, right? Yeah, because you, absolutely. you play something like Race for the Galaxy or Terraforming Mars Ares Expedition, sure, you get the added bonus because you chose that action. But in this game, I get to go first as the captain or the mayor or putting my stuff in the trading house. And that's going to shut you out or screw you up. That yeah, This absolutely. game has that extra cutthroat layer on top of that. Yeah, and there's definitely different layers of ability in this game. And what I mean is there's three of us in my group that played this a ton. And the three of us are far above everybody else around us as far as this game goes. So we have this whole meta going on. And it's just, there's a whole other level to this game where there's absolutely a right move in every situation. And once you've played this game enough, you know what that move is. You know, I know what that move is for me and for him and for him. And I know what people should be doing. And then I plan my whole turns around what should happen. And it really throws a monkey wrench in the whole situation when you get somebody who doesn't know that meta, that doesn't understand these grand strategies going on here, and they do things out of turn. And that really screws up the game for the rest of us. Yeah, and this game is infamous for the person to the left of the new player is going to win the game. Yeah, that's a common criticism of this game. Um, I this. You know, I talked about Carcassonne being the game that got me back into the hobby, but Puerto Rico was one of the, you know, after, you know, we started having a board game night, like, oh, what are some other games? Puerto Rico is sort of significant to me, and it's the first time I bought a blinged version of the game. I went Ooh, out, I bought, that, I bought that Puerto Rico Deluxe Edition back when, I guess it was still in print, or at least not yeah. too hard to get. Now it's, you know, I should have it locked in a bank vault somewhere. But, uh, <laughs> you know... Uh, so, you know, that's, you know, that was kind of cool, right? Like you get it and you're like, oh, these are nice components. This is neat. Oh, look, wow. You know, this is, this isn't candy land, right? You know, <laughs> but uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, some people also don't like the theme so much uh, of yeah, this. Yeah, I was going to mention that. I, it's very colonial. Uh, I actually heard a rumor that they're retheming this. Yeah, that's so. what I was going to say. There's They're working on a new version of the game with a different theme. And I, I also wonder if there'll be some tweaks uh, that come. I, I don't care what the theme is so i'm in whatever you know i'm interested anyway if it's just the same game i'm probably not going to buy it with a new theme because i've already got a deluxe version of this one so i'm excited that they're bringing it back out with a new theme just because it'll get people to play it again because i this game's fantastic i think it's still fantastic and i think it maybe it's just kind of fell off the radar and then it got a bad rap for the colonialism and it just kind of doesn't get played much anymore so <laughs> Well, I want to see the reprint just to bring it back. Yeah, but like you said, the uh, a lot of games have started doing that sort of role selection from Puerto Rico. So I think that's one of the reasons where people are just sort of playing those others. But again, I can't think of one that is so cutthroat with the role selection as Puerto Rico is. It's um, massively important. I yeah, agree. yeah. Um, so anyway, obviously, I was talking a lot about Puerto Rico, but that's because it's also my pick from yeah. 2002. <laughs> 
Puerto Rico. And We're believe it or not, title this the list of crossovers. Yes, oh and believe God. it or not, that is a three way crossover with board games. Hey! This was this when I got into the hobby. This was the number one game. On and it was for a long time. It was that way for a long time. It was alternating back and forth with uh, Twilight Struggle, I think, at the time. Um, so. Yeah, anyway, not a surprise at all that Puerto Rico is is number one at Board Game Geek. And really, I you know, I I don't even remember what other games from two thousand came from two thousand two because this is just it's right up there, you know. No no need yeah. to look deeper. <laughs> yeah, I agree. All right, cool. So two thousand three. Let's move on to two thousand three and I I'm going to revisit our friend Dr. Reiner Kinesia. His name Welcome is Welcome back, Doctor. Yeah, his name is actually in the title of this game, uh, mm. which is uh, Reiner Kinesia's Decathlon. And oh, okay. I'm going to tell you right now, pause this video, go to Dr. Kinesia's website and download this game because it is free. All you need to play it is a piece of paper, a pencil and 8D6s. Right. I don't think you can even buy this. Right. Like no, I think it's they never, just straight print and play off of the website. That's it. They never made a you know a retail version of this game. It's just straight print and play off the website. But this is there's ten events, right? Because it's decathlon, and each one is a different way to push your luck. A rolling eight dice. Uh, not all of them use all eight of the dice, I guess, of the events. But you know, like. You can decide to skip uh, distances at the pole vault uh, and then try to vault at a higher distance, right? So you're sort of pushing your luck that you're going to be able to, you know, jump a higher distance. There's the the it was the long jump uh, where you're rolling dice as sort of the run up to lock some dice that you then roll for distance, you know. But you can fault while you're doing the the run up to try to store the dice off. You can fault, and you know there's there's some take on it where you're you're basically trying to roll odd numbers and freeze those. And you know I can't remember which one's the shot put or the discus or whatever does the which one do you freeze the odd numbers versus freezing the even numbers, right? But you know you've got you got a dice and you roll and you can freeze. Any odd numbers you want, but if you can't freeze an odd number, you have faulted, and you're only going to get three attempts, right? So when you're down to rolling that maybe last one die, you're like, I've frozen all of these. I could just add those up and take this, but if I roll this one more, I might get a high number. It's going to add even more, and you know, on your first roll, maybe you'll because you know a lot of the events that you get to say three attempts on your first roll, like maybe you get a decent score. So on your second one, you're just going to like, I'm going to push it. I'm just going to keep pushing it till I get an excellent score. Because you've got something on the scoreboard, you know? You're like, and there's different ways to score the game. Um, and we keep – we uh, right – I've got in the little – a photo box that I keep the game in the little tiny photo box. I've got a world record sheet in there, which is, you know, got everybody's <laughs> name and score next to it. You know, who's done the best in an event and board game geek has a like running world record thing too. I even played this game on the forums on board game geek using the dice roller. Like I love this game and it's free. Go get it. Go play it. 2003. Isn't this kind of a, a roll and write. Uh, it's not really a roll and write because it's just a roll. The only thing you're writing down no is your writing. score. Gotcha. Yeah. I've never played this, but I don't know why it's free. That's probably why, because I can't get it deluxified. So, you know. <laughs> I mean, you can make your own <laughs> deluxified version of it. Go right ahead. I can see. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. So what Where have you we got? 2003? Yeah. 2003. I'm going to give you one more chance to warm up those typing fingers, kids, because I am going with a Game of Thrones. Which, if anybody knows anything, what I really mean is second edition. So I did a lot of research into this. And basically, this version, version one, okay, let's do it the other way. Version of the second edition is basically this game plus all the expansions that came out for it. So to me, this counts, right? So Game of Thrones is basically diplomacy in a fantasy setting with a little bit more going on. And, you know, if you watched our first video, I'm a big fan of diplomacy. I like that. And this is that. This is, you know, you're making deals and you're stabbing people in the back. And all of that is going on in this game. Meanwhile, the White Walkers are trying to come down and kill everybody. So you're kind of collaboratively working with that also. But you're really just trying to take over the Iron Throne. And you're going to do it any way you possibly can. Friends, enemies, stab your friends in the back. Do whatever you need to do to take the Iron Throne. And that's what this game is about. It's it's really good. I haven't played in a long time just because I I don't think I have that group anymore, really. Tiffany doesn't really play a lot of this fighty stuff. This is and, a con you know, game for me. This is a game yeah, a con for me. I get that. It's pretty long. 
because it takes a while. It's kind of procedural. There's a whole lot of things that go into it. There's some hidden information and, you know, like basically you can say, all right, I got your back. But then you put your orders down on the table and they're face down. And then all of a sudden you flip them all up and you get to see, oh, that guy's straight lied to me. He's attacking me, you know, and things like that. And then it kind of plays out from there. So there's traditionally a whole lot of yelling going on because people are stabbing each other in the backs. I mean, but you're going for the Iron Throne. What are you going to do? The, the theme of the books is here, right? This is really well done. You're playing on the map. You've got all the houses you know, you've got all the backstabbing and yeah, and even the battle decks have like all the characters and everything in it. So there's there's a bit of it's all here. I agree with you. This and I, is Game of Thrones. And I remember the stories, right? I, I remember the stories from playing this game. I mean, I think I remember I sat down to play this at a con with a bunch of people I didn't know and I uh we were playing with the expansion that added the seventh player or whatever. And oh, I was, yes. so I had just randomly drawn, I think Dragonstone. Is that the Island? Was that the name of the Island? Dragonstone? I can't remember. Yeah. Um, and like those two people on the land right next to me were just like friends. And they're like, let's just go wipe him out. And then we won't have to worry about him. <laughs> you know? And I'm like, what, what the game hasn't even started. And what, you know? And so they're already scheming. Right. <laughs> so, you know, there's, so there, there's no way I'm going to win the game, but I, you know, I did my best and I held them off and I held them off and I held them off until they started getting sacked from the other side by other people. And then right at the end of the game, I made a landfall and, uh, you know, some people were coming across the map and it was like, I, you know, despite the fact that from, from before the game even started, I didn't have a chance of winning the game. I got to be the kingmaker. I got to decide right there with my forces who am I going to support? Who am I going to screw? And that is going to determine who wins the game, right? And so, like, I had my own fun, you know, even though I wasn't going to win. Uh, but I, you know, and I would say that uh, this this game is probably fired diplomacy for me, right? I yeah. can't think of a time I would rather play diplomacy than this game. Well, I would rather play diplomacy if we were going to do it in a traditional way. And by traditional, I mean like a turn a week yeah, or play, something like play that. By mail, like, whatever. Yeah, something like that. But if, it, if I was sitting down at the table, I would absolutely play Game of Thrones. Yeah. And, you know, just as a side note, I never read the books and I never saw the show when I started playing this game. I didn't know what a Game of Thrones was, a Game of Thrones was, but this game was fantastic. So it got me kind of into the show and all that stuff. Uh, okay. I, I had listened to all the audiobooks uh, before I played it. So that was a different experience for me. But yeah, it's just a great pick. 2003 Game of Thrones, second edition. Second edition. First <laughs> edition was this year. Yeah. <laughs> right. All right. So Board Game Geek is going back. They're going back to the abstract well. And they're pulling out another GIF series, GIF uh, project. And this one is Yinch. Oh, and okay, there it is. I would say I think Yinch is higher rated than Devon, and it looks more interesting to me, you know, just for me personally. And uh, I don't exactly know how the mechanics work, but you're moving rings around the board. And when you move a ring, it drops a marker, or if it crosses over a marker, it flips the marker. And what you're trying to do is get five markers in a row, and you have to do that three times. I think I have that right. Right. So I don't remember the rules uh, well because i've never played it but i was just looking right. at it um so i don't remember the rules specifically of how the ring moves but like this idea that i'm moving rings around and flipping markers i it almost gives me a little bit of a go feel i guess okay. um, because you know how you can flip the pieces you know one way or another but um flip the territories or whatever what I, was I, the I other one Othello. Othello. That was yeah like the oh yeah you know what i'm thinking of Othello, not go duh yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it goes more about surrounding, surrounding, and capturing, capturing right? right? Yeah. So no, I'm thinking more like Othello, where you you get the two end and you flip the etc. Right. So yeah, I don't know. It, it sort of gave me that feel, except I so I would say if you like Othello, try this because this is probably better. Um, yeah, and uh, still, again, I think maybe not the highest rated game in the GIF uh, project, but pretty high up there. And BGG says it's the best game from 2003. Well. Maybe I haven't played it. All right. Well, for 2004, I say, no thanks. Gashink, <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, whatever the different versions uh, right. of this game are. So, 
you know, you've probably heard me talk about this on the channel before. You know, this is one of my, it's probably my top 25, probably my top 10. You know, like I, I love this game, no thanks, because it is so simple. You, um, you start the game with, uh, some markers, uh, and a card is turned over and the card is, you know, between one and 35. Uh, and you can say, okay, I'll just take that card. Or you could say, no, thanks. You put a marker on it and you pass it around the table. And so the next person can put a marker on it, and pass it around the table. And the markers um, are valuable. Um, they're negative points and you're trying to get a low score. Um, so, you know, at some point you may just take it because you, you're running out of markers or you want markers or whatever. Um, but when you take the card, now you have the negative points for the face value of that card, right? So a 15 is now essentially negative. Well, it's Positive 15 points, you're trying to get low points. You get the idea. Anyway, but the interesting thing about the game, though, is if you can make runs of cards, you only score the lowest in the run. So if I take the 24 uh, and then the 23 comes out, nobody at the table really wants the 23 because that's a lot of points. 23, they don't want those points. But to me, it's actually negative one point because i have the 24 and the 23 now i'm only scoring the 23 i'm not scoring the 24 so the 23 comes to me and you think oh i'll immediately take that i want that card no 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 i'm gonna put a marker on it and pass it around the table so that it collects more markers because nobody really wants that card and then it comes back to me and then i decide hmm should i take it now or do you think i could pass it around one more time you think it'll make it all the way around to me again you know and that's that's the moment that i love in this game like mm, can i pass this around the table one more time and you can you can really mess yourself up right because you can like i'm going to take the 34 and i'm going to take the 32 and then when the 33 comes out nobody's going to want it i'm going to grab it and yes. i'm, I'm going to go from having a ton of points with the 34 or 32 to just having the 32 points or but then at the beginning of the game, like five cards were removed from the right. deck. Right? So, so the 33 may not even be in the game. And then you're just sitting there whole game going, where's the 33? <laughs> yeah. So anyways, so simple to play. Uh, but the dynamics of the game are what make it super interesting. And yeah, that's, that's why my number one game from 2004 is no thanks with an exclamation point. I think I'm leading in this category. I, I have no thanks point. and survive. Uh, and boy, what was my first one that had the exclamation point? I remember you had one with a question mark. Who's it? <laughs> yeah, who's it? Exactly. <laughs> nah, that should. I'm telling you, that should be our next list after we finish this up. Is games <laughs> punctuation with, mark punctuation marks? Enough. Yes. <laughs> nice. All right. So, so what is your game from 2004? Well, as simple and quick as you went with your selection, I went completely the opposite direction here. So I'm going to talk about a six-hour game, basically. So <laughs> I, can, I, can play, game? I can play No Thanks for six hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's like 50 games. <laughs> <laughs> My game for 2004 is War of the Ring. And it, oh. it does have a second edition to it, which is basically just a, a facelift. All right. But so I actually have the first edition and a number of the expansions for it. So basically, this is another one. All right. So... We, when we when we're talking about Game of Thrones, we were talking about how that's Game of Thrones in a box. All right, this is even more so. All of Tolkien, well, or at least you know the three main books, are in a box because this is what you're doing. One person now the box says two to four players, but that's kind of a lie. It's like if we played chess and split half of like. Oh, I'll be half of white and you be the other half of white. And those two people will be half of black and the other half. So it says two to four, but it's really a one or two player game. Uh, but one person plays the forces of good. One people plays, you know, one person plays as Sauron and the forces of evil. But the really cool and interesting thing about this is they're basically playing two separate games. All right. So the forces of Mordor are basically trying to conquer the world. Okay. The forces of good are just trying to get that ring into mortar and destroy the ring. So there's a really interesting dynamic in this game where, like I said, you know, the forces of mortar are just trying to take over the world, but they also have to pay attention to the ring bearer and try to figure out where he is and stop him from getting that ring to Mordor. And it's the same thing on the other side. And the free peoples is really hard because when the game starts, almost nobody's actually at war. You have to like drum up the support to actually bring the other countries into the war because that's kind of the way of countries, you know, especially peaceful ones. They don't want to get in a war. So it takes time. 
to actually get these. So you're basically doing the best you can, like the Dutch boy, like sticking your finger in the dike, trying to stop Sauron from taking over the world while you're desperately trying to get that ring to Mount Doom to destroy it. Uh, it brings a couple of different elements in that are really awesome. Uh, you roll these dice, you roll a handful of dice at the beginning of your turn, the dice have symbols on them, and you have a handful of cards. And the symbols on the dice tell you which cards you can play because those it'll be those symbols on those cards. And it's all runes, so it's going to be really hard for me to describe to you, you know. It's like square with a dot in it, or maybe banner, you know what I'm saying? Like, there's all these different symbols, and then you play the cards out of your hand. The cards themselves are great. They're full of the lore. Everything in the books is in these cards. And basically, like I'm saying, you know, I, I really can't stop gushing about it because it's it's one of my favorite games. It's an incredible production. It's incredibly long. It's fairly complex as far as it goes, but there's nothing like it. It is War of the Ring in a box because it's War of the Ring. I have not played this game. Uh, I would play it. Uh, I do like fantasy. I like dungeons. I like dragons. But I do not like Lord of the Rings. I I have not read the books. I sort of have read sections. I I find it boring. I, I didn't like the movies. You know, I'm an anomaly here, right? And yeah, you know, a little bit. Yeah. So I mean, it's that's funny. Right. I I don't like things other people like, but for me, I, but I, I, I would I, Tolkien. Yeah, I would play this game anyway, right? Like, even though I don't particularly, it's not it's not like I actively dislike Lord of the Rings. I just don't like it. Yeah, so, but I would I, I would totally play this game anyway, though. Because I've heard so many good things about it, and I have seen the movies, so I would get the whole, you know, trying to get the ring to Mordor, right? Like, I, I all that thematic stuff would not be lost on me, I guess, is what I'm saying. So, uh, yeah, no, that's that's a good pick, and uh, you know, I've seen this being played, and yeah, it's it's an impressive production. <laughs> it's an impressive production. Yes, it's yeah. quite a feat, and uh, and I feel like it, it's quite a feat for that kind of year. Like, if if this came out today, you'd be like, oh, that's a good game. But for 2004, this was just like leaps and bounds ahead of the massive universe in a box kind of idea. So it's one of my favorites. Yeah. Well, to close out 2004 and to close out this list, uh, actually, it's going to be a little anticlimactic because you called it. You already talked about it. Board Game Geek's number one game from 2004 is Power Grid. Told you we'd come back again. Yeah. Yeah. Freedom and Absolutely. Freeze is back with a game that doesn't start with F, unless it's Funkenschlag. <laughs> yeah, it's Funkenschlag, exactly. All of his other yeah. games start with F because he's two F spiel, Freedom and Freeze, right? Um, but uh, yeah, you know, uh, we already talked about it. I still want to get this game to the table because we've got that deluxe edition, but one day I will. Yeah, well, maybe we'll play it sometime. Tiffany likes that game a lot too. It's just hard to get a crew together for exactly the two things that you said. Because everybody has either already played it and they're like, ah, let's play something else, something new, something shiny, or they're just intimidated by the theme is dry. It's a whole lot of economic. When you start to describe it, they're like, I don't know, man. You know, so it's hard to get to the table. But Tiffany and I both like it. We'll be happy to play. It. But, you know, on your last list, when I talked about Netrunner fans, Power Grid has its fans, too, right? There are yeah. people who are just like, this is the best game ever and that will never change <laughs> you know and they will put it head and shoulders above every other game for their entire lives um so so yeah i, you know. I mean nothing against freeman priest but i think this is by far his best design ever it's just a home run in every way it is definitely his most popular that's for sure all right so looking ahead you know i was very excited about the last list this list i was pretty excited about my next list is kind of quirky looking ahead to the next five years. So I don't know, I don't know where you're at no. with that. But I actually haven't made the next list yet. So oh. it's all a mystery. Ooh, super surprising. Yeah. No, no, I got I got the list here. I'm looking at it for Board Game Geek and myself. So all right, cool. Well definitely join us next time for that. I'm Steven. That's E Rock and we have been gaming through time. See you next time. <laughs>